welcome to the very first inaugural uh, in the Land Registry Roundtable. We're planning a couple of more already, uh, one for September, and we'll have uh, some additional new experts online at that time. Uh, I was about to say good morning, but it's also good afternoon and good evening. We have people from all over the world that have registered and that are online now uh, from countries uh, such as, uh, well, UK, United States, Europe, India, Africa, Mexico, Italy, Spain, Australia. It's midnight in Australia. Thanks for joining. A little late there. Uh, India, uh, Hong Kong, Mr. Chen, thank you for joining. Uh, Israel, Sweden, Germany, and se several other countries. So this is a terrific event, a lot of interest in blockchain. And it, I think this shows that there's, uh, well, it's global land registry systems and land governance. Mm -hmm. I'm the chair of ANATPA's real estate uh, land registry subworking group uh, and the moderator for this first round table. A little bit about me, I have a company called Power of Chain, LLC. And uh, what we do is we provide blockchain services, uh, business development services and advisory services to the real estate industry with a focus on land registry systems and land governance. Uh, so what exactly is an APA? An APA is the International Association of Trusted Blockchain Applications. And it was launched just about like over a year ago by the European Commission, which is the strategy and policy formulation organization behind the European Union. Uh, it is global though. Uh, and uh, Mark Tavener, our executive director of INAPA, and one of our panelists will tell us a little bit more about the overall mission of uh, INAPA. It's, it's good to know that INAPA has 14 working groups, uh, one of which is of course is the real estate working group. And uh, in the real estate working group, there are three sub groups. Uh, one is devoted to the tokenization of real estate assets, fractionalization. The second focuses on uh, data, property data, that is the aggregation, uh, identifying and aggregating data for analysis and use. And of course, the third is our group, the land registry. The mission of the land registry group is pretty simple, it's education. Uh, education for those, especially in the land registry field, uh, working in it and those related uh, to that process. Uh, we try and recommend uh, things to do with blockchain and consult and assist with the implement implementation of blockchain solutions. Uh, some of these initiatives, initiatives that we have are roundtables such as this. We're developing webinars uh, recorded and on, de uh, recorded, uh, on demand and, and live. And we're going to be writing a manual, or a, I guess you'd call it a guideline book, for land registry officials to uh, have a better feeling for what blockchain is and what it can do and how it can impact the land registry uh, processes. Um, the way we set up this roundtable, I'm going to introduce the, panel, the six panelists first, and then we're going to segue into the first questions, which have to do essentially with what blockchain is sort of a blockchain 101 in 10 minutes. So that'll help set the baseline, I think, for us to understand, all of us to understand a little bit better what blockchain is as we dive deeper into what it's, what's happening with it now and what's gonna happen in the future uh, with our panelists. Uh, we want this to be an interactive session, of course, so we encourage questions, uh, pertinent questions and comments. Uh, and I'm going to introduce the, the public uh, sector panelists first, and I'll start off with Marian Tarashvili, who is from the, or is in the country of Georgia. Uh, welcome, Miriam. Uh, she is the, she works for the National Agency of Public Registry and has been involved with blockchain for several years. Uh, and we'll be learning more about what the country of Georgia is doing with blockchain and what, how far they've gotten along with it. So that'll be extremely interesting from the public sector side and uh, Miriam is, uh, Miriam is um, zooming in with us from the capital of Georgia, uh, Tbilisi. And uh, Georgia is, a and Miriam, correct me, I think Georgia is a country of about 3.8 million people. Uh, 3.5 million. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining welcome. us. Welcome. Thanks for presenting. Yes, uh, also, on the public, also on the public side, uh, I'm re really happy to have this next, next person on. And I'm going to preface the introduction with a comment. Here in the United States, we have 3,418 counties spread out. 
Each county has a recorder's office or a register of deeds. John Merkovic works for one of those 3,418 counties, but county recorders in, it's called Cook County, which is in the state of Illinois. Uh, and uh, he's based in Chicago, I believe. Is that right, John? Chicago, you're zooming in from? I am, yeah. yes. Uh, our neighbor, Oak Park, and if you're familiar with architecture, the home of Frank Lloyd Wright. Yes, and I'm just Hemingway, by the way. Correct. <laughs> anyway, John is uh, the deputy clerk with Cook County. And the, the most amazing thing about John and his work is that they, Cook County did the very first, in the United States, the very first pilot program with blockchain between, I think it was 2016 and 17. John wrote a terrific summary of that uh, project, a use case summary, uh, three, published three years ago, I think, John. And it'll be interesting to see how some of your thoughts uh, have changed about blockchain since you wrote that. And we look forward to uh, kind of exploring your experience with Cook County as, as a public official. Uh, the next I want to introduce is, is uh, Chris Christossen. Chris works is the lead software developer. He's our, he's our techie here on our panel. <clears throat> We're very uh, happy to have him because he's, um, he's got that special background with blockchain. And uh, Chris works for a company called Medici Land Governance, MLG, out of the state of Utah. Uh, and he works with a team of developers with MLG. And they are doing some <clears throat> very important things, real world cases, which we'll explore with him. Uh, MLG has also signed agreements with other countries around the world to explore blockchain uh, and other things that they're going to help with land registries. Uh, they have a project in Mexico, in fact, that I think they're working on now. So anyway, Chris, thanks for zooming in from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, you bet. And by the way, I need to point out, I'm, I'm actually one of three uh, software developer leads at Medici Land. Right. It's great to have you. And I've been following uh, MLG for the last three years, and I've been following Chris's presentations whenever they show up on YouTube, and I've learned a lot from, from Chris. Uh, the next up is Philip Jarman from uh, the UK. Uh, welcome, Philip. Philip is the co-founder and, and CEO of Sesso Global, a blockchain company, real estate blockchain company, who's doing other things outside of blockchain. But I had a great conversation three years ago with uh, Philip's partner, David Block, um, in the summer of 2017. And they've evolved and come a long way since then. Uh, Sesso is focused on Africa. And that'll be the most interesting part for us to see what is going on with developing countries. Uh, I think uh, they are in South Africa, Nigeria, and Ghana uh, is, is yep. part of their efforts. And uh, Philip, uh, I think you're zooming in from Cambridge, uh, England. I, I am indeed sunny Cambridge. Just to slightly correct you, I'm uh, COO. COO. Dan, right. my, my business partner, Daniel Block, is, is CEO. Um, but CEO. yeah, much... Um, a UK registered company, but our heart is very much in Africa. So all those territories you mentioned. Okay, but well, it looks like you're at the beach, which which is where I wish I was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the next up is John Reynolds. Uh, John Reynolds, also from the United Kingdom. Uh, John is the, the COO of CodeJute, and his company focuses, uh, well, actually, they uh, it's a platform that they provide for transactional services, real estate, connecting all the players on uh, on on the chain, and uh, it's going to be very interesting to hear from John. Uh, John's company and himself were very much involved, I think, with a project called Digital Street in uh, the UK, and they did, uh, along with others, did some work with uh, Her Majesty's Land Registry, beautiful name for a land registry. Uh, so, John, we're going to be looking forward to hearing more about your company and also how you interacted with Her Majesty's land registry and what your thoughts are and what they're doing or what they will be doing if anything with blockchain so thanks. welcome from uh, london i think thanks 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 john and uh, hi everyone very nice to meet you <laughs> um and last but not least is the is mark Tavener. he is the executive director of anapa and uh, before joining anapa he worked for six years with the bitfury group as global ambassador in uh, markets development uh, six years with a major blockchain company. 
Uh, and as I've spoken to John over, John over the last few, or Mark over the last few weeks, uh, there's a lot we can learn from him in terms of, of um, his experience in going out to market with blockchain technologies and introducing it to different countries. So welcome to all six. Uh, we're gonna jump into uh, the educational part of this. And I think the first question I'm gonna ask is uh, to, um, let's see, ask John Reynolds. Uh, this is Blockchain 101, John. We have 10 minutes to set, set the, uh, the world straight on what it is and what it isn't. How would you identify, or uh, I guess define blockchain, blockchain technology? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, oh, in a couple of minutes, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just just uh, in its. It, I suppose I, I'll I'll talk about what we use it for in in its simplest form. Um, you've industry has spent maybe the last fifteen years um, or twenty implementing systems within organisations um, that enable those businesses to run faster, and everybody's familiar with their internal CRM. SAP system, whatever it might be. Uh, and, and what blockchain and distributed ledger brings, at least to the enterprise where we focus, is this um, it's a virtual database that everybody can connect to. So you can connect your internal systems to other people. Um, and, and that gives you a shared single source of truth. Now, of course, you could solve that with one central database. But the question is, who would run it? Who would own it, et cetera, et cetera. So, in a, in a property um, value chain where you have multiple different businesses, a central database, one entity to run that doesn't really work and it doesn't work for many marketplaces. So I think blockchain is a, is a shared database um, that multiple companies can access uh, with, with, with confidence to have a, a single source of truth on a transaction, be it a, um, a contract, an invoice or, or any other piece of information that you're sharing with your uh, business partners. Thanks. Yeah, so it's a virtual database, it's shared, single source of truth. Um, Chris, from your perspective, and you can throw in some technical, technical terms if you like. <laughs> uh, how would you, uh, you know, explain what blockchain is to someone who doesn't know, know what it is uh, and what it, what it does? Yeah, actually, uh, I like to look at blockchain as a, as a suite of technologies. It's kind of like a intersection of cryptography, distributed computing, uh, actually economics, game theory, and for land registries, I actually count archival science too as part of it. Because in, in my view, what at least for, for land registries, one way to look at uh, um, blockchain technologies and what it can do is that it's kind of like creating a, a universal filing cabinet really that uh, has the ability to be shared, a shared database, and has the ability to give access to uh, anyone who wants to go look at it to, to find information there. And so um, that's probably in a, in a nutshell how I would kind of look at it and try to explain it to people. And then there's a lot of detail that comes after that. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine more detail than you want to hear about. But, and John Merkovic, you, uh, back in the days, you know, you must have had to explain what blockchain is to a lot of people, especially in your offices there at Cook County. How would you define it or explain it, what, what it is and what it does? Yeah, when I, when, when I started in the space, there was a lot of fighting over the name blockchain and what it meant. And, you know, some people believed it meant only one thing, which is Bitcoin. And then there were others who were, were very open-minded. And you know, I tended more towards the distributed leather ledger, sorry, Ethereum type of smart contract model. But so, you know, in, in the past, it was, you know, a very specific definition. Now I think it's changed to become, you know, really to echo, not to repeat what everyone else has already said, but it's, it's become a new way to build an architecture software, basically to promote decentralization. And the chain is simply a, a method to, to arrive at uh, consensus amongst parties who you know, have no reason to trust each other. So uh, I think the definition has, has really opened up pretty wide now. So it's it's exciting. Um, uh, Miriam, you, you, from your perspective over there in the country of Georgia, how, how have you been explaining it to people um, over there who really don't, didn't know what it was? Uh, what was your your um, your your way of um, shedding light on this this technology. 
Uh, well, first of all, yeah, again, uh, being a government representative, I will uh, try to explain it in the government's point of view. So, yeah, as John said, like we have heard this question numerous times and we have answered this question numerous times and all the answers were different, right? So blockchain is a distributed ledger, blockchain is an immutable database, it's the asset management platform, it's the solution for the democracy, it's a value exchange protocol when we're talking about the uh, land titles and what are the words associated with the blockchain, right? It's transparent, incorruptible, cost-effective, secure, unalterable, decentralized, and trusted. And who faces the biggest challenges in terms of transparency, corruption, security, and all of those words? Of course, governments, right? Governments are the ones who manage the assets in the country. Governments are the ones who are uh, expected to fight against corruption. Governments are the ones who need the trust to be reelected later. And governments try to decentralize the service delivery to provide like, cheap, fast, and secure services. And all this development of what's going on in this fourth industrial revolution, it brings new challenges for the governments, right? First of all, in terms of cybersecurity, I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> cybersecurity, illegal usage of personal data, cyber attacks, and so on and so on. And governments have no other choice but to become more flexible, to become smarter. And it, traditional centralized mechanisms of problem solving and trust enhancing are not effective anymore. And here comes the blockchain which is one of the solutions which brings totally new era of democracy as it's transparent and incorruptible and there is no centralized version of stored information for the hacker, the hacker to attack which is not controlled by the single entity and it's the mechanism to which brings everyone in the like highest degree of accountability it's also cost and time effective and eliminates the intermediaries i think this is what i usually try to explain when they ask me like, what is blockchain? There, there is no easier way to, to explain what is blockchain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's difficult. It's um, that was incredible. Hey, Philip, uh, how about you? Where, how would you, how have you been describing it to your uh, potential clients or, or others? Yeah, so we always um, combat it from the angle of what, what the technology can solve. What's the, what's the problem that needs to be solved? So, I can't add to the descriptions that have already already been given in terms of distributed ledger, um, in terms of cryptography, but the way that we have to commercially position it is that is the the problems that the technology could potentially solve because a description a, 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 a true understanding of what it can do is going to is a long process right particularly if you're not coming from a, a particular computer science background you're coming from a, a banking background so. Um, we try and we try and position it in terms of um, added security, uh, transparency, and it's worth remembering that in certain instances transparency doesn't work for everybody. But fundamentally, um, uh, an ability to increase revenue and decrease costs around transactions. So there needs to be an economic positioning of the benefits of of the of the technology. Yeah, well, that's that's you hit the key word benefits. What what's the value proposition? We're going to dive into that. In the next round of questions, uh, again, uh, next up is Mark. Mark Tavener, I sort of glossed over at the end there, uh, before giving uh, your definition or, or how you see blockchain described. Uh, I'd like if you would say a few words on behalf of Anapa as the executive director and des describe the mission and so forth. Well, thank you, John, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening to, to everybody. Um, what an impressive uh, volume and breadth of experience we've got gathered on this call today. So, John, we truly appreciate the efforts that you've put in in, in gathering this great audience. In has been convening discussions to advance the topic of blockchain since uh, its inception, which was in uh, April 2019. And as John mentions, the, the, the inception moment really came from a little push within the European Commission, who saw that there was a, a need in the market to convene constructive discussion between public participants, governments, stakeholders, and uh, perhaps standards-based organizations, and the private sector. So that's in ACBA's mission. Uh, I'm proud to say that just over a year and a half later, here we are with nearly 170 corporate members, uh, almost uh, 21 governments around the world who sit in our government advisory body, and some approximately 45 academic institutions who sit on our academic advisory body. Uh, we're very open, we're very inclusive, 
and we continue to engage with policymakers and legislators to try and ease some of the friction points that prevent the mass adoption of blockchain applications and DLT technologies, as well as blockchain technologies around the world. Uh, just to come to your question, John, and thank you, thank you for giving me the floor just to introduce that for there. Um, but to come back to the question of, of blockchain and its definition, I, I would like to put forward a point of view that the definition of blockchain really depends on the application, and the application should be focused very much on the problem that's trying to be solved. And that descriptor will be different based on each application and based on each potential customer, and most certainly different based on each problem that it's trying to solve. But at its fundamental level, it's about reestablishing trust. Uh, and that trust has been eroded, particularly in current times, and trying to create trust at the mechanical level so that the, the human nature of transactions, of business processes can, can, can be somewhat removed. And therefore, the, the data that we rely upon for transactions, for decisions, for information can have a greater degree of trust. Uh, so I want to put forward the point of view that as an industry, we've been particularly poor at educating the world about the benefits of blockchain. But we've done a really, really good job of overhyping blockchain and its potential, such that in the early days, and Mariam will, will attest to this, when I turned up in 2013, 2014, when I was working for the Bitfury Group, and I was talking to Swift, I remember being at Cybos, which is Swift, uh, the interbank messaging platform. I remember being at Cybos, their, their big annual event in Singapore in 2015, and starting to talk to people about blockchain then. And the big banks looked at me rather bizarrely and said, let me get this right. Help me to understand. You work for an Eastern European founded Bitcoin mining company, and you want us, some of the largest financial institutions in the world, to consider looking at your technology. Why on earth would we do that? And then we had similar conversations with governments around the world. And Mariam, I'm sure you remember the early days when Vic Fury Group was talking to the government in the Republic of Georgia. We had very similar conversations. And I that's do. because we, <laughs> we weren't getting to the essence of what the value was in that particular application to that particular audience. We just naturally assumed that everybody could see the immediate value that blockchain and cryptocurrencies and ledger-based technologies could provide to the world. And therefore, we went off hyping everything. So I think we as an industry, and this comes back to part of Inactiv's mission, need to pause. We need to re-engage at an intellectual level with policymakers, legislators, and with the private sector. And we need to re-educate a little bit and focus on the value creation. We certainly need to focus on interoperability. We need to focus on the creation and adoption of standards. And we need to get different geographies working together between governments so there can be a level of interoperability between these applications. So let me pause at that point, John, for, for, for risk of going into uh, a passionate monologue. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm going to revert back to each of you right now. And I'd like to for you to take a, two or three minutes to you know, further describe what you do, but what, what you do more so with the blockchain, on the blockchain level. Uh, because, um, I mean, Philip and, and John uh, Reynolds, you're, you have a platform that is sort of expanded towards the, the transactions, if you will, or, and, and properties before it hits the, uh, the land registry section. Um, so I think let's start off with, with uh, let's see, Mariam, describe, What's going on with Georgia? Uh, I guess you were working with the Bit Theory Group, and what what happened? Where are you now with blockchain use for your la national land registry? Really? Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm, uh, I work as the head of project management department at National Agency of Public Registry under the Ministry of Justice of Georgia. And, uh, well, uh, why I am here, the reason is that Georgia is the first country in the world that started using blockchain technology in public services, right? And that was actually the question, what are the real use cases? And Georgian case was the first real use case, which actually made Georgia 
truly visible on the blockchain map and not only the blockchain map, a lot of people learned about the country because of this project. So we started this project in 2016 together with the Bitfury Group. It was a very smart decision from the Bitfury Group to come to Georgia and start this project because uh, I always say that countries like us, uh, you just mentioned 3.5 million people, right, uh, with uh, Soviet history and so on, we cannot really compete European countries in many, many things. So we have to find the new mission, something new to, to become known, to become famous, to become advanced. And this technology was really one of them. So uh, it was the first time in 2017 when the national government used Bitcoin blockchain to secure and validate its own official actions. So since um, 2017, uh, we... Uh, already stored more than 3 million extracts in blockchain system. Extracts, we call the documents that, which certify the ownership of the uh, property, not only land, but also the um, houses and so on. And uh, we do it through um, uh, hashing. So we generate the hash code for each um, extract, each document, and then we send this hash code to the uh, blockchain system. Um, so far, the, the project, the first pilot project, was about that uh, validating the actions and uh, enhancing trust and storing all the information uh, in blockchain system. The main reason was, uh, of course, um, enhancing the uh, security. It's all good. All is everything is okay in the country, but we still wanted to add an additional security layer uh, on our existing system, and that's uh, what we did. We can't hear you, John, you're muted. I see that you're speaking, but we can't hear you. Uh, we have a question just popped up actually through Slido. Uh, it's from, a, uh, from Mr. Anonymous. Uh, <laughs> there's been a, a lot of talk about benefits, uh, benefits of blockchain. Um, He's asking, he or she's asking about use cases, which we'll get into. It's uh, Paul Chen. Here it's written that it's from Paul Chen, not quite anonymous. Okay. Uh, I, I can't see this. This says anonymous. Yeah, okay. um, in this case, he's asking about use cases, but we'll get into that. But what are the, what are the benefits that you have realized? Has it, has it decreased costs? Has it increased, decreased corruption and fraud? Has it uh, increased uh, efficiencies in your processing? Uh, so I cannot say that it decreased the corruption because uh, corruption was non-existent in, in this system, in this system. Uh, and you can check like the rankings of corruption perception index and so on. Georgia has really, really good positions. So that was not the original reason why we started uh, exploring the technology. For us, the main uh, reason was security. That's why I mentioned the security. Uh, so... Uh, we keep restoring information on our central servers, centralized servers, right? Uh, at the moment, in recent years, luckily, everything is okay in Georgia. The situation is totally calm and so on. But still, it was, what, 10 years ago, we were facing the serious wars uh, from neighboring country. And we tried to keep this uh, security, like higher level of security. If something happens to our servers, as blockchain also protects us from physical destruction, we know that our information is safe and it's safe in the largest Bitcoin blockchain. So uh, that's the biggest um, uh, biggest uh, benefit what we have. In terms of customers, in terms of citizens, of course, trust. So they don't have to trust anyone from the organization, like me or my coworkers. They're trusting this uh, huge technology, right? Uh, Marion, quickly. So you have a, a, a blockchain system in place, which is, it sounds like it's a parallel system to your main central server. Uh, that, yes, so uh, we store all the information on our central servers and also... I store the hashes in Bitcoin blockchain system. Okay, thanks. Hey, so John, that's why it's an additional layer. Right, additional layer of protection or, or uh, yeah. immutability, I guess. Uh, John sure. Merkin, um, Cook County. Cook County is the most populous county in the state of uh, Illinois. You're the second most populous in uh, the United States behind Los Angeles. <clears throat> um, you went through, uh, I think, I think a nine month pro, uh, pilot program, I think 2016, 17, with many players, including attorneys and so on. 
<clears throat> could you maybe describe why you started this that process, what you learned from it, and how far you, Cook County has gotten in discussions on adopting it? Because I don't think you've adopted it quite yet. So the floor is yours. Yeah, and I'll try and wrap in an answer to Paul Chen's question as well and kind of bounce off what Marion said. So, so the Bitcoin blockchain is, is the proven use case that allowed us to say, you know what, we're going to jump right to trusting and testing because, you know, I can, you know, we can read things and understand math and cryptography enough that to realize we're trusting mathematics here and not other politicians or governments. So, yeah, we, we, that allowed us to jump in really quick. And, you know, we, at first, you know, it was a, a legal effort to see what the law looked like in Illinois. You know, is this, is this legal? What permission do you need? You know, what makes sense? So, we, you know, we spent a couple months analyzing the law and then, you know, we were trying to build some type of transactional system that would use the Bitcoin blockchain to certify the transaction and become the record. This is kind of the holy grail and land registries of blockchain is, is where you have one action that is both the, the transfer of the asset and the record. So we, we, we settled on Bitcoin because it was proven at the time Ethereum had, had had the DAO hack and it was, you know, kind of in the woodshed as far as being trusted. So uh, we did that. And then, you know, one thing that we built internally in Cook County is, is similar to, to things that other blockchain companies are doing is we, and what Georgia did, I believe a little bit is, is you, we create a hash uh, redundancy of, of a file. So you know, if a citizen has a PDF of their their home deed and we've hashed the the thumbprint of that document in a public blockchain, if something bad were to happen, say in 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 a in a small country like a warlord takes over and burns all the deeds, you know the citizens could re restructure their own land record. You know, similar to you know efforts like Hernando de Soto did in the 80s, and which has really been an inspiration on why I've been involved in this and. You know, even Bitfury Group has been an inspiration to me back in you know 2016 and, and seeing what you guys were doing. This is the right thing to do for governments. It's the right thing to do for countries. And that's why I jumped in because I knew that the USA needed this. And you know, unfortunately we're hamstrung here and you know, we're watching a lot of small countries take the lead and jump ahead of the United States. And uh, it's exciting to watch, but yeah, that's that's sort of what we did, and and you know, so we have all these hashes. You're correct. We did not implement it going forward due to the fact that you know there's no demand for it, and you know, to, to pay a couple, you know, the transaction fees to hash everyone's records into the blockchain would be expensive. So we actually are probably going to do that soon. So stay tuned for an event with a a major or sorry a partnership with a major known player in the space to finally get those those. Uh, you know, hashes onto a blockchain permanently, you know, we're going to be, be doing that. But uh, yeah, just really excited about, about the space, uh, decentralized identity and um, the, the whole thing. Yeah, well, that's, that's interesting news. We're going to have to check back with you, back to you uh, probably what in a couple months and figure out what you're going to be doing. Um, I, I read someplace that you're actually, the Cook County, I think is using blockchain in a, in a different, sector or area is that did i read that right you know I, I i don't know i don't think i mean maybe i don't think so you know my unfortunately my skepticism in the space always causes me to say that it, everything you hear in blockchain is usually wrong when you first hear it or it's so overhyped that it's, it's you know so far from the truth but you know our office isn't using it there you know there may be Yes, I think Cook County government is so big. There's, you know, 20,000 employees, I think. So, you know, there, there may be a nook and cranny doing something with it, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, let's see. Philip, uh, did we talk to you yet about that? So, um, um, what was the, would you just mind repeating the question, John? Sorry. No, we were talking about uh, some, uh, I just wanted to ask you very quickly um, what, um, you, your your company is doing CESO. Uh, you're based in the UK, but your focus is Africa, which is extremely interesting, I think, because of the developing countries and so forth. And uh, I might add, just as a footnote, even developed countries have issues and problems which would warrant the use of blockchain. I don't know if anybody knows, but the number one white collar crime in the United States is mortgage fraud, as an example. 
-hmm. So we have problems too. And uh, so anyway, getting back to Africa, uh, tell us what you're doing there and, and yeah. why. And, so, and um, I think it's, I, I totally agree with what everyone said about the blockchain hype. And I really like the question from Paul Chen, show us the money, right? Show us, show us the benefits, because ultimately this is about um, being more, it's about being more efficient. It has to be more efficient, otherwise systems won't, I don't deserve to tr um, transfer over. I'll give you a very quick breakdown of what we do at SESO. Um, at the heart of SESO, we're seeking to achieve and build trusted, reliable registries in emerging markets through blockchain technology or DLT technology, because we fundamentally believe in the power of property as an asset class, okay? Um, in, uh, in parts of uh, emerging markets and parts of West Africa, you do have historical issues that relate to property ownership, and these need to be understood. So, for example, you may have tribal-owned land, for example. Now, tribal-owned land can, could be owned by multiple individuals. So getting, um, getting uh, that signed off can, you know, can be risky, okay, in terms of um, selling a plot of land where not everybody signed off, and then you have future claims of ownership. So in terms of coming up with a tech solution that can cut, uh, that can nicely um, deal with sort of uh, the way that property is culturally owned is difficult. So therefore, what we had to quickly learn was that in order to scale effectively in emerging markets, you needed to adopt the right strategy in order to get good data, clean data. That's what we love. Because if you digitize bad data, you're just doubling down on the problem. So with, with our strategy... It's very simple. We operate a B two B to C business model. Um, B two C is very simple. We sell properties and access to property related services. So we have an ecosystem of services buyers can access. So that adds the kind of to a um, distributed way of making decisions. But we deal with um, a specific type of property. These are new, nearly new, or limited, with limited or no transaction history. So the ownership data we get is good data. Now that has a knock on effect in terms of the property is that we target these uh, properties in the um, we Once we've secured that, then we can move on to the properties further down the, you know, uh, down the chain. But um, it's all about, for us, it's about adopting the right strategy, getting the right data, establishing a, a decision-making process where you have a buyer, a seller, and a trusted um, legal entity. And the, uh, to, to do the due diligence. And the output of that is trusted data, which then you, you can then hash. So for us, it's, um, it has to be about the, the strat uh, adopting the right strategy and, um, you know, and using it in a commercial setting. Yeah, I think you mentioned in a previous phone call that, um, as, as I see it from what you mentioned, you, you, you are working with new developments, which lead to new clean data, right? Uh, and you can start your own little ecosystem of blockchain perhaps and, and have uh, uh, that a particular yeah. registry for that development. Is that- It's, it's a registry brought about by uh, private sector transactions, right? Um, I mean, I think ultimately in many parts the, the, where we're working in West Africa, you do need um, you do need government involvement in order to truly, you know, um, truly sort of solve the issue. What we're trying to do is we're trying to establish a process that where we can where we can then integrate governments, but it is about a process of acquiring the data. So we have, for example, um, uh, a project in South Africa with the Centre for Affordable Housing and uh, a management consultancy there called Seventy One Point Four, where we have built up a process uh, that, that jumps between different um, uh, different decision makers. The at the the, um, the the output of which is reliable data. It, then it goes to the government for registry. Right. So right. it's about being a process that um, that establishes the data upon which you can then use the technology. Okay, thanks. Um, Mark Leswig here in the United States asked a really good question, which I'm going to ask at the end of uh, our discussion from each of you on what you're doing. Um, let's see, John Reynolds, uh, CodeJute, tell us a little about your platform. Uh, you're not using a regular uh, mainstream uh, blockchain structure, uh, you're using Corda. Uh, and maybe you might describe what that is. <laughs> all, all, all three might have have an opinion on whether they're mainstream or not, but uh, yeah. Right. Thank you. But I really um, like to describe that and then sort of segue into uh, the things you did with uh, Her Majesty's Land Registry. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Super. Super. I mean, in, uh, sorry. Can, yeah, maybe. I, uh, thanks, John. I'll, I'll start with start with that. So, 
I mean, my, my background's in, in enterprise IT um, and, you know, working for a company like Dell and Fujitsu and, and these types of organizations and putting in, you know, CRM systems, you know, Salesforce, ServiceNow, Oracle, SAP, those sorts of things. So helping businesses run faster. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in 2016, I was, I was trading uh, cryptocurrency, just, just playing around, really. But what I found really sort of blew my mind a little bit was this concept that if I send somebody, a, you know, a PDF, they could send it to everyone else on this call and I wouldn't know. But if I send them a token, um, then I, I, we can track that around. And I thought, this is really interesting uh, in terms of business process between organizations and keeping track of data. So that was, that was interesting for me. Um, I'd been working a lot with government and, and UK government, you know, each department, defense, health, education, prisons, they're all like mini businesses and they don't communicate very well. So we thought about this uh, idea of an enterprise, uh, of a blockchain actually for government. Could we kind of um, wire a government up? And uh, I, I think Mark Tavener, you know, he, he kind of nailed it. The definition depends on the use case. So our, our use case there was how could we get government to sort of share data better and 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 when we uh, when we looked at that we, having put office 365 live in government it's really really painful to do something like that it can feel like putting a man on the moon so um, you know we thought putting government UK government data on you know the ethereum network back in in 2016 sort of 17 it's just never gonna happen so we started researching the uh, permission uh, platforms um, and, and and that was kind of research that was going on and then in 2018 the UK land registry was the first UK government department to want to explore this technology I mean and again it comes back to to why it's it's not necessarily like some uh, perhaps a use case in in, in Africa and I, I was at the a World Bank conference a year ago, and there's a, you know, a lot of good uses there around for avoiding corruption. But in the UK, we're very happy with the land registry as a central database. So what they wanted to explore is how might DLT technology make the home buying process simpler, faster, and uh, and and cheaper. They were the benefits they were after, and and they could have said, well, hang on, we run this centralized database. Everybody's happy with that. The fact that all of the business process that um, is required to make a simple change, changing my name to your name, and ultimately that's it at the end of the day on the title. Um, it, it, it can take six months in the UK and it's really expensive and really painful. So they right. decided to kind of lean forward and start this digital street community where people could explore how DLT uh, could solve that problem. So that was a specific use case. So we look at Corda um, uh, in the end because it, it, it's really been designed. It's got some unique properties around, really around business process and, and, and allowing uh, nodes to share these these workflows effectively. Um, we won that. We started working with them for uh, six months, and, and and part of that we realised there's there's nobody. The UK government is not going to build this digital backbone, this kind of um, you know, uh, let's call it a digital backbone for the property market. No, nobody's going to build that. Um, so we decided we pivoted and we became a product business and we, uh, we did a POC. Um, first off, we said we do a global POC, just to, a laboratory thing, really. Um, and uh, we had 23 companies, uh, sorry, 40 companies from 23 countries run nodes. So we had nodes in Australia, States, Canada, Singapore, uh, and it was a really exciting science project. But I mean, that's what it was. And, and then it's like, well, how do you now put this into production? Um, and, and I think the interesting thing is, and, and, and probably lots of blockchain businesses go a little bit wrong with this one. Um, when you really think about any marketplace, if, if you want to sell into a state agency, like, or you want to sell into a bank, or you want to sell into a land register, you're kind of building a vertical product. If you want to sell a solution that kind of follows trade or sale of a home or whatever, each one of those verticals already have their embedded software. So unless you're like a really amazing product team with loads of capital that can build the best mortgage application, the best real estate application, the best notary application, the best land registry application, then you're going to struggle and you've got to get everyone to adopt your applications all at once. Um, so so we built a, a platform that allows the application to drive the marketplace to connect um, so people using the applications they use today uh, can connect, interact, and transact, and, and follow that that property uh, train. And we just finished a pilot 
and we're getting ready to go live at the end of this year. Um, and, and the value it brings is for the consumer, it makes it faster and stress-free because they don't, well, not stress, never stress-free, but they don't have to chase everyone around, find out what's going on in all these different systems of record. They get one window into the entire journey. And for the businesses, it makes the transaction quicker. In the US, sorry, in the UK, everyone gets paid when the transaction completes, so that's valuable. And it reduces cost. I mean, we estimate about 30% of cost in a home buying journey is phoning around. So what happens is people use one system um, and then they want to talk to somebody else. So what they do is they detach the thing, attach it to an email and send it. And then the other person detaches it and uploads it to their system because there's no digital background. And, and I suppose just the final point, well, you could use APIs for that. Yeah, you could. There's like a hundred different software companies in the marketplace and they could all have spaghetti of APIs, but that's really expensive, um, really complex. So they connect to us and they connect to everyone. Uh, so that's what we're doing. We're building, we're not building a front end, we're building a back end. And, and I suppose that the value for the land registry at the very end of that journey is at the end, they get a, a request to update the title, change the title, and they can see the whole digital trail. It's very difficult to game our platform because you're gonna to have to game all the nodes. Um, so there's a kind of trail of what happened as opposed okay. to one individual at the end going, okay, please make this request. And they've got an army of people that need to check that all the stuff was done. So anyway, that's a bit of a, a very rapid brain dump. I'm conscious of time, but yeah, that, that's what we're doing. Yeah, but you mentioned you're, you're going to be doing a pilot. Um, is this a pilot? Sorry, we've done it. We, yeah, we, we, just, we just completed a pilot. Um, with uh, We called it a minimal viable ecosystem. So we had a leading um, software provider from a state agency, from conveyancing. We had NatWest Bank. We had a consumer app. We had a surveyor. So we got a bunch of software companies and a bank together, and we did that. Um, and that was successful. So now we're uh, just getting ready to go into uh, production at the end of the year. Terrific. Um, moving on to, uh, and I shouldn't mention and, and reconfirm that this part of the whole purpose of, the, of, of a roundtable like this is to is to cut through the hype. So I think I think we, that's this is where we're heading. And uh, I'd like to ask, um, well, Mark, uh, I'd like to ask you and if you could explain what you did with uh, the Bit Theory Group and what sort of uh, experiences you had uh, specifically, if you can talk about them uh, in terms of blockchain for land registry, because I know the Bit Theory Group is, has a lot of services. So uh, if you can share that, that would be nice. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, John. So uh, I, I just want to preface uh, everything I'm going to talk about now with a, a disclaimer to say that it's been two years since I left the Bitfury Group. Uh, I spent six wonderful years there learning um, more than I'd ever thought I'd learn about blockchain. Um, I came from a, a telco background where I worked with a team that built the world's largest uh, collaboration tool, conferencing tool, video conferencing tool. Uh, on, on reflection, actually, how wrong I was to leave that 25 years too early, huh? If we were still in that today, it'd be like uh, shooting fish in a barrel. But nonetheless, I thought I knew a lot uh, about uh, distributed working, about technology, about deploying applications at speed, about educating, about the value of applications, uh, until I got dumped into the world of, of blockchain. And I, I have some, some, some really fundamental questions still that I'd like to pose the panel and, and maybe the audience as well. Because those six years of working with a Bitfury group, uh, running around different governments around the world, uh, trying to find the early adopters who would listen to the potential for this technology, who would volunteer problems that we could solve, and who would allow us to create the early minimum viable products that would le lead to the trailblazers. All of that experience left uh, a lot of deep scars on my back because it's very hard work. And, and here we are, what, some six, seven years later now, and I still don't see that there are too many applications that have been adopted at scale. I, I don't see the pace of adoption speeding up, certainly within the public sector and specifically in relation to land registry. And I fear that the same challenges exist so now with my hat uh, as the executive director of Inatba on, where we are convening public-private discussions, trying to identify those friction points, bring the policymakers and the legislators to the table to discuss, to be educated, 
to receive evidence and to work collaboratively to try and reduce those friction points. The question I've got to the assembled uh, audience, to the panel, is what are the friction points that still remain that are preventing these applications from being adopted at massive scale? Well, I appreciate that because I'm saving that sort of question towards the end is a part of our closing statement or closing okay. question on, on, the, on mass adoption. But hold that thought. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Chris from Medici Land Group, Land Governance, excuse me. Uh, you guys are doing some amazing things um, that we read about, press releases and so forth. Um, you did something really unique, though. I think one of the first counties in the United States to actually use blockchain, uh, you provided the services. I think you, you and your team helped build it out, and that's Teton County in Wyoming. And I understand that a second county in the state of Wyoming is also looking to you to build out some blockchain. Uh, let's cut through the hype. What, what, how, how, does that, how did that work out? How did you approach them? What are they doing? Did they... Build, are they transferring all their records over? Is it a parallel system? Is it completely open access to the public? Did it help their, uh, did it increase efficiencies and processes? Did it reduce cost? Uh, Chris, the floor is yours. Uh, well, for starters, I, I probably have to say that uh, uh, the blockchain task force in Wyoming actually approached uh, Medici land governance uh, actually, they, they approached uh, Patrick Bird a little more directly, but uh, uh, th through him, uh, the, the job actually came to Medici Land Governance. Um, and what they were looking to do, uh, because the state of Wyoming as a whole is working very hard to adopt blockchain technologies across the board. Um, uh, um, in recent, the recent two years, they passed a whole bunch of legislation just to make it easier to use various uh, cryptocurrencies or blockchain technologies to, to run a business. Uh, for example, they have they created some laws that made it possible for, uh, for, for banks or money businesses to actually hold uh, people's digital assets in, uh, in custody uh, for them. So that opened the door to you know, all kinds of um, you know, all kinds of things within the blockchain industry. However, in terms of the county clerks, um, the blockchain task force also wanted their county clerks to start moving all of their records on the blockchain because they saw the benefits of, uh, you know, increased trust in the records, uh, greater security for uh, the records. And they also recognized that by doing that, they would form a foundation for a lot more complex features that, uh, blockchain technologies can provide. You know, they they kind of recognize that, that they're going to need to do a stepwise approach of first recording records, then moving on to like smart workflows, smart escrow, <laughs> all the way up to uh, the complexities of fractionalized ownership, or fractional ownership, and even peer-to-peer -peer exchange of real property. So <clears throat> that's kind of the context that they came to us. So um, our approach when we work with them was really the, the county clerk there, uh, Sherry Daigle, she said, we, you can't interrupt our, our processes. Uh, I think uh, Philip uh, spoke to this uh, a little bit earlier. Um, they, they wanted the example of, they had already had an application that allowed them to abstract out uh, data from all the instruments or the documents that they had coming into their office. Uh, and they wanted to continue using that. Um, and as a matter of fact, when they pushed the button that said, you know, publish to the web, um, because they had a web-based application that allowed uh, public access to their, uh, to their documents, um, you know, they, they wanted the, the workflow to be really similar to that. So, uh, so what we did is we worked with their developer of, their, of that application and uh, they provided us just a few extra fields within their database to be able to mark a record as ready to publish to blockchain. Um, in terms of user actions, the button that they used to publish something to the web was exactly the same thing that would flag a record ready to be posted to the blockchain. And then our software essentially plugged into their, their data set. And on a daily basis now, we reread their database and every record that uh, is ready to be posted to the blockchain 
uh, we, we, we form the correct transactions, we, we create uh, a special record that we call an OIP record or an open index protocol record, which um, you know, allows for a decentralized indexing system uh, to work against uh, that record. Um, all those transactions gets formed and our software actually uh, broadcasts those transactions to the uh, blockchain network. And, uh, and then, so, yeah, the point of all that, I just want to say is that we, we, we work to create a, like a parallel system that I think some others have seen so that they could see what it was like to have a record on, on blockchain. Okay, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and um, you're moving on to another county, right? Is that what I... That's what correct. I uh, we're currently working in Carbon County right now to do the, the, same, uh, the same work. Uh, now, fortunately, Wyoming counties are smaller than a lot of other uh, jurisdictions. So uh, one, one good thing we get in the case of, uh, of Teton County, it, it kind of added up to 187,000 uh, property related records. Uh, right. That was spanned over one and a half million uh, tr uh, blockchain transactions. Uh, in Carbon County, uh, we're probably going to be looking at the same thing. But uh, some of the interesting things there that caught our attention is, um, is, is Carbon County does have a lot of mineral rights uh, available uh, yeah. in, in their system. So this is going to be an opportunity for us to um, actually uh, put those mineral rights onto, uh, onto blo a blockchain system. Oh, that's terrific. I like that idea of uh, the, the, the underlying assets uh, on the blockchain. Uh, okay, so uh, Chris, that leaves 3,416 counties to go. So it's an open market, right? So, well, well, we're, we're tapping a lot of shoulders. <laughs> uh, I'd like to go back to a question that Mark Leswing here in the U.S. asked. Um, uh, his question is, are there any experiences hooking up to ex existing non-decentralized ledger systems? Um, I throw that to, uh, to anybody who can, uh, wants to kind of field that question. Uh, yeah. um, sorry, John, you go ahead. But I, I can answer that question very quickly and say no. A lot of the data that we deal with is um, uh, is paper based, right? So yeah. what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish, um, you know, essentially a, a, a digital record, you know, because we there is no legacy system um, where we uh, where we are. So there's an opportunity to essentially establish one. So I do, uh, that's my my food for thought on that one. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I think. Um, it's an interesting, really interesting question because people talk a lot about interoperability um, with between blockchains, which is which is fascinating and, and, and important. But actually, what about interoperability between the DLT layer and the rest of the world? I think it's the most important thing. No land registry exists in a bubble. It's it's a system, but there are lots of other legal system finance systems that need to come together to harness a property transaction. So. Um, I, 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 I'm not, I, I think there's a lot of really good work. Um, recently, there's something called Baseline Protocol, I think is a, an interesting project about uh, stare, sharing a sort of baseline on, on the mainnet. I'm not that close to it, but it, it, it certainly looks interesting, like that concept of keeping off-ledger data. It's certainly what we do. We do on, a, on, our, on our platform. Obviously, it's a permission, open permission network, but it's all about keeping the off-ledger data in sync with the on-ledger data and, and creating that single source of truth. There's no, there's, there's just no point having a saying, well, there's this, there's this platform, it's a single source of truth and everything else is out of sync with it. So, um, and, and, you know, we, we found it relatively easy to integrate to off-ledger data. Most platforms these days have APIs, um, you know, simple security protocols, uh, most software vendors or, even large businesses are happy running nodes. So, happy. Yeah, it's, I think it's uh, it's very doable and, and not not that uh, not that complex or scary for IT departments anymore. Yeah, yeah. Mark Mark Leswing hit on something re really important, and you know Mark is a has been a great mentor to me. He's involved in a lot of the real estate standards organizations in the U.S. and I think he would tell you best of all is that what the United States is lacking is a effort to do a, a standards as far as real estate technology, you know, what does a buyer and a seller, what do you call them in a system? Do we use the archaic terms, grantor, grantee? 
So the United States has a lot of work to do on standardizing, you know, legal descriptions of property, unique property index numbers. Many counties do not even have those in the U.S. So they would be start, a lot of counties would be starting, you know, almost to, as places in, in uh, certain other parts of the world that lack that as well. So yeah, to, to get there in the U.S. needs needs an effort like like happened 25 years ago in the electronic recording. You know, the industry got together and they developed XML standards for transmitting, you know, images of, of scanned handwritten documents through the Internet. Well, now it's the time to go one step further, shunt that archaic method to side, which is a barrier to advancing this technology in the U.S. because the incumbent players are selling 25 to 50 year old technology, which is, you know, TIFF files and fax machine technology. So it's, it's really up to us to come together in the U.S. as the stand and create a new standards organization and, you know, look at what other people, you know, the work that they're doing in other countries and, you know, try and force some states to develop at least statewide standards. That's what I'm going to be working on in Illinois a lot more. Yeah. Here in the United States, the several of the states have set up, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't call them lobbyist groups, but they've set up working groups. California has a, the state of California has a, a, a government sponsored working group for blockchain and Texas is ramping up and John, you're involved with that in, in Illinois. Um, one of the things we haven't touched on yet really was uh, regulatory and, and legal issues with blockchain and, and, and land registry use. Uh, there's a question here that I'll, I'll shorten to, uh, he, met, he or she mentioned Sweden's pilot program. Sweden did one of the first pilot programs out. And uh, it's surface, surface issues like legal status of digital signatures. Um, I've heard that a, a lot, that, that there are issues with that. What are those issues? Uh, is, it, um, is it legal to have a, in, in the States or, or up maybe in Georgia to have been recognized digital signatures? Or is it uh, something that is uh, not recognized as a legality? Um, well, um, we have the law, we adopted the law on uh, digital signature and uh, accordingly it's absolutely legal here. We use digital signature. We don't use anymore this so what stamps and like handwritten signatures, especially yeah. in governmental organizations. We have the uh, digital signature and uh, it works without any problem. Okay. Um, here's a question. If, if you only store hashes on the blockchain, and, and for those who don't understand, a hash connects, uh, well, connects the blocks and the documents and the information, how would you deal with the loss of the central repository of land titles? Well, if the, if the people have their original documents and files and they haven't lost those and we have the hashes, we can, we can match everything back together but if but if we lose electricity, if there's an EMP, we all lose everything. Right, right. Well, of course, uh, citizens are encouraged to download the PDF version and to have it their copy. So if something happens to our servers, of course, they will have the proof uh, because we cannot translate hash back to the document, right? So they 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 have these uh, PDF versions in, in their devices. Um, uh, I, I would suggest uh, considering a decentralized storage, uh, something like IPFS. And uh, for those out there who don't know what that is, that's uh, the interplanetary file system. And it uh, provides a mechanism to store data in a, on a decentralized network. So your data yeah, could actually be yeah. copied. To so once it's decentralized, you won't have those, those centralized data problems. I mean... Yeah, I'm looking at I'm looking at a structure that uses Cloudflare combo with IPFS to to guard basically TXT files and CSV files. So I'm actually getting down to the oldest type of, of bare bones technology that you can do. Basically, strip even away the PDF. Essentially, if you can you can get a TXT file interacting with a CSV database and hashes. You know, I've got I'll I'll, I'll show you the, the the most archaic looking system that works the best. <laughs> Uh, here's a here's a question that uh, I'm not sure I understand, uh, but um, I'll throw it out to you all, uh, Chris, maybe, especially. Uh, have the speakers integrated GIS polygon data to define property dimensions? Have you used it to prevent double spend? Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, in, in directly, no, we haven't quite made that connection, um, but I think in the uh, chat, 
someone asked a question that uh, uh, was very interesting. Uh, ha I haven't done it yet, but I, right off the top of my head, I was thinking uh, it actually would not be hard to take spatial data, uh, create one of these cryptographic hashes that people were talking about, and use that as a way to kind of cryptographically link that as a record, uh, you know, within a chain of title for any given token that represents real property, and that might provide the the proof and uh, to to be able to make that linkage that uh, the original poster with the question is is asking for. Okay. Um, here's a question: As we head into the home stretch, we're going to open it up to more questions from the audience. <clears throat> But I like this question because uh, it's an important one to ask, and it gets back to the cost, <clears throat> the costs, in the land registry or a county of, of setting up. And the question is posed as, what's the order of magnitude of cost to set up property ownership registries in the blockchain? What are the major costs? Infrastructure, data conversion, licensing, and so on. Um, and there's different ways that I think blockchain companies charge for services. Uh, it's a, on a per transaction cost. Uh, there's probably, a, I don't know if you run it on a subscription basis. Uh, can anybody talk about, you know, what 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 one could expect if once they've gone through the pitch, what it's going to cost me? Uh, so um, now what I can say, even though we have not spent anything because of thanks to Bitfury Group because they covered <laughs> all the costs, I guess the transaction cost is uh, one of the big, biggest costs because in terms of uh, employees, for example, in terms of infrastructure and so on, like that, no, not that much. We have not really uh, changed anything. We have not really had any major costs, but the transaction, so during the day, we already stored more than 3 million transactions, right? And especially when we're talking about Bitcoin blockchain, the transaction cost is related to the Bitcoin price. So this gift from Bitfury Group became so expensive later that we decided to use the Merkle tree and to collect all the um, transactions during a day. And at the end of the day, then uh, send it through uh, using Merkle tree. So yeah, I guess um, transaction cost is uh, the most expensive. Uh, Chris, how about you? How do you approach, uh, how, how have you approached county, red, uh, county uh, clerks and directors in talking about blockchain, uh, do you go, what's the process? Do you set up a pilot program first? Do you do a little test of a, of a, of a municipality with a certain number of records? Then you go further if the county would like to proceed further. Uh, can you talk about generally? Yeah, yeah definitely. I, I, you know, since uh, the, the business side of things is sort of outside of my wheelhouse, I won't speak directly to that, but I'll share a little bit of, you know, the experience, what I've seen. Um, what seems to be really attractive is, well, definitely doing a free pilot uh, to get in there and, and show uh, what, uh, you know, the blockchain systems can do. I mean, there is this attitude of, well, I want to try before I buy, which is usually why you end up getting this requirement of, uh, well, you can do your system, but it just cannot impact my current workflow at all. Uh, so th that's why we have to do little tricks of finding uh, easy integration points for existing applications to, to feed data into uh, the, the blockchain recording software that uh, that we have. So I, I guess what I often suggest to consider when people talk thinking about uh, price is, um, you know, number one is really think about uh, what you want, well, how much does it cost you to actually secure your records in, uh, in a centralized system, whether it's keeping your data and application in uh, Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud, or even your own data center, you know, versus participating in a decentralized uh, uh, network that, that holds your, your data. Um, there, are, there will be costs associated with that, but it's just, you know, the type of thing that needs to be compared, uh, compared to. So those are, uh, you know, that's type of things that usually kind of bring up try to get people to think about different ways of looking at the cost of, of using a blockchain system. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, we're heading into the home stretch. I wanted to ask my, uh, the last thought, thought provoking question. Maybe we, we could talk about this for a couple more hours, but um, I'd like to fr phrase the question to all of you this way. Um, there's a terrific book that came out uh, several years ago. It's called The Tipping Point. It's how little things can make a big difference. 
Uh, the tipping point is that magic moment when an idea, trend, or social behavior crosses a threshold, tips and spreads like wildfire. Uh, I've always said that blockchain is not a revolution, it's an evolution. But uh, Philip, what are your thoughts on the tipping point? When, when will blockchain for land registries especially uh, reach that, I guess, that what we, call, what we call mass adoption? Yeah. Enterprise. So I think um, for me, there are, there are two important points to make. One is interoperability and one is hard work. And it's through that that you get scale. It's very important that these systems are able to um, link together. So you have a, essentially a sophisticated network with which to um, connect, connect parties in order to make decisions, et cetera. Um, I think part of the problem with the technology has been crypto because people sort of saw the immediate benefits of that. So the more interesting technology, which is distributed ledger technology, is going to take longer to evolve. I think it pro it will it will without a doubt come from more developed markets and where you where you have more resources. I mean, um, certainly in, in emerging markets, everybody can see the benefits of greater transparency in terms of liquidity moving into the into the um, into the housing space. But um, in terms of in terms of standards. Standards will be set within more developed markets, and then um, more developing markets will need to catch up in order to benefit from from the liquidity. So in terms of the the, the, you know, the tipping point, I do look. I think we we, we do have st st um, still some ways to go. In terms of simple networks, they can be they can be set up right. But but um, in terms of really taking advantage of the entire of the, the technology in its entirety, it will evolve in the same way that people have understood the way the internet's evolved and and the way that, um, you know, it, it can be used. Miriam, what do you think? Where's the tipping point? How far out? And what do we have to, what hurdles do we have to get through to get to the point where it's mass adopt, adopted? Well, I guess the trust uh, to the technology from the influential companies and influential governments are increasing, right? So there are the governments who are following others. So when they see that it worked at some point somewhere, okay, then let's do let, let us do it, that as well. So I think we're looking at each other. If it was successful at one in, in at some place, then uh, others also repeat. So. Uh, I guess more successful cases we'll have, more and more it will be expanded. So time will be needed a bit more. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask you, it will take months or years, but uh, I hate asking that question because um, it's a guessing game maybe. Chris, wh what, do you, what are your thoughts on uh, mass adoption, uh, the tipping point and the challenges or hurdles? I really like in uh, the idea that Blockchain adoption, especially in uh, the land registry space or in this domain, is probably going to follow a path similar to what we saw with Linux. Uh, yeah, for the, uh, you know, Linus Torvald in uh, I think 1991 pu first published uh, the Linux operating system, and then before he knew it, just masses of developers started to to work on that project. And over time, and uh, it was not measured in months; it was many years, but over the years, uh, adoption of Linux in enterprise spaces just kept increasing in over time. And now we're at a spot where, where when everyone says, okay, what kind of server system that we wanna have? I mean, Linux is the operating system that uh, everyone gravitates to. I, th I think because an, an ecosystem is missing right now for the, all the blockchain technologies. Earlier I described blockchain as a suite of technologies that yeah. uh, do these distributed ledger things. Um, the ecosystem doesn't exist. Part of that ecosystem is the standards for interoperability. So we need to build that up. But also more importantly, I think uh, open source projects need to increase in use. Um, and the reason why I emphasize open source is because usually the, the barrier for a lot of developing countries is to actually to purchase the software it takes to do what, or to participate in this ecosystem of, of using uh, using blockchain. So I, I think as open source projects also increase in popularity that provide this ecosystem, just like Linux, it's gonna get to a point where someone's gonna start saying, hey, how do I, uh, how do I keep my records secure? And then you're going to have a developer say, oh, well, of course, you're just going to use this blockchain library here that uh, will do it for you. Yeah. 
Uh, John Merkovic, what are your thoughts on, uh, I'm sure you have many on, on uh, potential mass adoption and you know, how do we get to that point? Or when do we get to that point as well? Yeah, think, thinking about government adoption, Chris is right. Uh, really what we need is an open source software revolution in this country for government. You know, Cook County spends too much money paying, you know, companies to silo products that take them 10 years to build or obsolete when delivered and have to be rebuilt uh, immediately. I don't know why we spend $100 million on Windows licenses probably in Cook County when we could connect, you know, uh, Raspberry Pis to the internet. This, you know, a lot has to be done. I'll mention some of the barriers in the U.S. to, to adoption of land. Uh, we have no Torrin system, so it is actually illegal for the government to, to help its own citizens know who owns the property. Uh, that's one. Uh, all the all the intermediaries that, that rent seek off of that model, attorneys, title companies who, you know, all they do is make money off of inefficiency. They have very much money and they, they fought me and they they will fight all of us and they, you know, they will win. Big finance has, has fought this and won. Um, what else? People like being a product. Okay. You know, until people in this country stop taking free stuff in exchange for them being a data point, we'll never have um, any of this. Um, what else? Uh, governments have no money. This is, this is too hard to do. Uh, government is opposed to encryption, right? We, we're not allowed to, to whisper secrets into each other's ears anymore leaving us vulnerable to, to nation states all over the world who will destroy us. Uh, fear of automation is, is a barrier as well. Okay. Uh, losing jobs and, you know, no, decent, no decentralized identity structure yet, which ties you from where you're born to when you die in a private way that allows you to, de you know, interact with your government and networks in a decentralized way. So, Unfortunately, so that's the barriers to adoption in government uh, worldwide. You know, I don't see like I think Mark said, I don't I don't see an, a worldwide trend towards using cryptocurrency or decentralized technology. I don't think, well, especially in comfortable countries, people don't you know they don't want to own their own money. You know, they would rather pay a fee to have somebody else guard it for them. You know, they would rather be a free product. You know, they don't want to spend a hundredth of a penny to send an email. It's just, Unfortunately, I hate to be a naysayer. It's really stacked against us. And I, my hope is that crypto and blockchain isn't the start of a bifurcated world where the where the rich and the people with resources are able to separate themselves even more from the poor. I got into this to help the poor, and so and I know Chris did too, and and Miriam, and and we're all in this for the right thing. So that's that's what keeps us fighting. Yeah, so uh, next, John Reynolds, uh, what are your thoughts on the tipping point? Uh, yeah, um, I, I suppose at least in the UK and I'm sure in lots of other countries, I don't see a tipping point. I don't see the, I don't see the logic of putting land registry on a blockchain. It just seems a bit daft to me. Um, there's a, uh, you know, there's this ICO craze where everyone's going, oh, we're going to put land registry on the blockchain and raise loads, millions of dollars, but it's... We trust the UK government to look after the title. There's nobody in the UK worries about coming home and somebody else uh, living in their front room, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's not a problem worth solving, and DLT just doesn't have a part to play. Um, but in uh, in all of the transactional stuff, moving home is a nightmare, and there's loads of fraud. But actually, once the register's updated, there's a ring of steel around it, and, and we're pretty safe. Um, so I think in the UK... Netherlands, I've heard lots of lots of IT people from lots of land registries going, hey, it all it all works and, and citizens are the same. So I don't think there's a movement to decentralize land registries in a lot of countries. Um, so yeah, no tipping point for the uh, land registry, but the inter-business transaction um, of all those intermediaries and removing a lot of those intermediaries and streamlining it and making it more secure, faster and cheaper. Uh, I think there's a use case there. Okay, um, I had a conversation with some people and when I attended a conference in Athens, uh, Athens uh, Greece, 2018, and I was speaking to uh, some of the people from Finland and Norway about uh, what they thought about blockchain. And they basically said, well, we, we looked at it, but we don't, we don't need it. Uh, we have advanced systems, uh, they're very safe. Uh, so that's somewhat the attitude at this point. Um, Mark, Mark Tavener, what are your thoughts on, uh, I, might, I might be even saying 
using the term wrong, tipping point, but uh, uh, what are your thoughts on turning this into, a, or when it can turn into a mass adoption type of a situation for land registries? So thanks, John. I, I go back to a comment I made earlier because I'm not sure if I'm qualified to answer this with, with conviction or accuracy because I'm the guy that uh, got out of the video conferencing, audio and web conferencing arena 20 years before this moment happens. And now suddenly even my grandmother, who's 99 years old, is, is conference calling me. So I'm not sure I'm really well positioned to look into my crystal ball, but I, I want to draw some comparisons because I'm a bit more positive. Uh, about the the value that blockchain and DLT can create for the right applications to the right audience to create the, the right amount of benefits uh, and value. Uh, and the comparison I want to draw is to the internet. You know, the internet took 40 or 50 years to go from being possible to having the right conditions, including the right ecosystem, the right approach to open sourcing, and the right development of standards, you know, that finally resulted in TCP IP before applications could be built by some really, really smart people that showed the value that this technology platform could be used to create. Uh, and I think there are some similar parallels there. It's not, you know, a, a direct comparison, but there are some parallels that we can draw from. Several members of the panel have spoken about the need for open source, for standards, I personally believe that for governments to take this type of technology on, on a large scale, there's going to be a need for push and pull. And I think the pull requires governments and citizens to be better educated, to feel as though they have a bit more trust and a bit more understanding about the applications. I certainly think, you know, in my personal experience of trying to, to sell these applications, that governments and large customers are a bit sensitive about not being the kingmakers, i.e. they don't want to award enormous high value projects to determine who eventually is going to be the lead, the standard bearer and the largest company in this space. And at the same time, they're most definitely sensitive about vendor lock-in. So by that, I mean, if they make a decision today to go with a particular technology vendor, is that a decision that they can't reverse from subsequently if they decide that they want to have a change of strategy or they decide that they can't live with that particular vendor or even live with that particular technology platform. So this concept of education, standards, interoperability and openness is certainly an inhibitor at a government level. And my final point is really to do with the push. So that was the pull. The push is around our ability as a, a relatively newly formed industry, DLT and blockchain uh, professionals, to engage with the incumbents. The incumbents have got uh, an ability to, as it specifically relates to land registry and all other suites of services, the incumbents have got a position to defend because their livelihoods and the livelihoods of many of their employees depend on the services that they've spent many years building up. And at the moment, that defensive position, is, they are more motivated to maintain that defensive position than they are necessarily to engage with a new type of technology and to find ways to collaborate with new uh, potential partners. And I think part of that is because, and I've been involved in this with some of the incumbents, the, the cost of change, the amount of effort that they have to put into developing a taxonomy, for example, that John mentioned earlier, of reinventing business processes just so that you could add this new blockchain vendor in, into processes which already work quite well and most certainly are being profitable. They don't see the reason why they should put cost and complexity into their business model because there isn't a great deal of value that they get in return. So I think that the push elements, the value proposition to the incumbents is not clear enough yet. And I just want to close out, John, thank you for giving me the floor by reminding everyone that Inactiva stands ready to, to facilitate these discussions. And I know John is very keen as chair of the subworking group uh, of real estate, focusing on land registry to, to build out this, this discussion subsequent to today. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It's about, for us, for me, for our subworking group, it's about education and outreach at this point. Uh, we have a couple minutes left. I want to throw a couple of questions out there real quick. One is from John Stevens. Well, two are from him. But uh, for Wyoming and Georgia, was implementation on a public chain that can be verified by any third party? Implementation on the public chain can be verified. That, that, that wouldn't work for us at all. What would work for us is a private permission chain. 
How about um, uh, in Chris? Wyoming? They uh, they absolutely wanted it to have a, an open uh, public blockchain uh, for the purposes of uh, making it possible for any third party to be able to access that data. Okay, and, and, and Mary, we deal with wouldn't accept wouldn't accept that. Miriam, I would assume that you, uh, anyone can verify or a third party could verify uh, information oh, on it. Well, yes, first of all, the information is public uh, the, in Georgia and also it's like Bitcoin blockchain. As far as I remember, uh, Ukraine, uh, when Ukraine was planning to implement uh, a blockchain for e auction system, they wanted to use uh, Transparency International as the of governmental international organization okay. as, as the third party um, okay. to verify the um, records. As far as I remember, that was planned. I don't know how it ended, though. Okay. Uh, we have like a minute left or so. I just like want to thank everybody very quickly. Uh, I'd like to shout out a big thanks to John Mercurio from uh, the communications director for ANAPA for helping me out and Martina Piazza in Italy, who has also helped out immensely. Uh, this is, has been recorded. Uh, I understand it will be uploaded to the website and perhaps other places, John Mercurio. Um, and the questions that we didn't get to, uh, John Mercurio, perhaps we could uh, set up a way we could answer those uh, in another uh, way uh, that's, that's published uh, as part of the follow-up to this, to this inaugural uh, uh, roundtable. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I would like I conclude the roundtable, and I, like I mentioned, we will probably have another one in a, a few months. There's lots to talk about, and I appreciate um, everyone's uh, attendance and and uh, interest, especially in this type of a process. Thank you, everybody. Thank uh, you. Thanks, John. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.